Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Matthew, for your update. If you're turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. We're going to catch a, a really short little review of a few paragraphs from Tuesday night because they were very important. But we're not going to be there very long. But these are paragraphs that have a lot in them and we for sure need to be able to remember and put the pieces together. Here it is on the board for you. Living the spiritual life is presented by Paul as being now possible only because of a total break with the tyrannical power of the sin nature that occurred at the instant of justification when we were born. That is when the tyrannical power was broken over us we were unbelievers, and un every unbeliever is under the dominion of their flesh or their old sin nature. He, meaning Paul, presents this as an absolute permanent transition that cannot be changed or revoked, meaning that the old sin nature or your flesh in no way can again acquire ascendancy over you or have absolute dictatorial power over you. That is a thing of the past. But that doesn't mean that the power of our sin nature is terminated or that it is dis diminished. Now, you would think maybe some people would come to that conclusion since it no longer has dictatorial power over us. Maybe its power was diminished or maybe it was terminated. But you should know for yourself that it is not. What it means is that we can now resist its power because we have an infinitely greater power in us, the Holy Spirit, who enables us to resist temptation and to have victory over sin. But the power that he has has not been diminished. And if you just think about your own self, this is what I did for my own self, I thought, well, I know what it was like to be tempted to satiate my lusts or to do something I ought not do before I was saved. And now I have many years after I have been saved, and I can't distinguish any difference that, that, than that power was before than it is now. In other words, when I'm tempted... I am tempted. I mean, it's not like, well, he's just kind of got half the power now. When I'm tempted, it seems like it's full power to me, and it is, and that's the point I'm trying to make. But they, things have, are extremely different because now several things have happened, but the main thing I want to point out is that we can resist now. When we were unbelievers, we had nothing to resist with. And the enabling power of the Holy Spirit is something that is infinitely more power than what our flesh has. Believers are assailed not only by their sin nature, but also by the world and the devil, fallen angels. You've heard me say before, who do we battle? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, the world, of course, is what the world is. We just talked about the flesh. And it's not really the devil. I don't think the devil, he, he's not omnipresent. He can't just be anywhere he wants to in all, all, all the places. And I don't think there's any of us that are a big enough fish for him to be interested in. However, he can delegate to his fallen angels the, the minions that he has, and they can do his bidding. So the power of our obsessions, our temptations, nor our lusts have diminished, nor has the glory of lure and deception of the world, nor has the lies and treachery of the devil. None of these things have diminished at all. They have not changed. But we've changed 
because now we are a child of God. We're members of the royal family. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we have the potential to acquire the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, you all know that the way that we acquire it is when we sin, we acknowledge our sins, and it is forgiven, and then we have the full power and the full thrust of the Holy Spirit on our side. Uh, however, we have resources to defeat all these through the power of the Holy Spirit, Bible doctrine, and our desire to please the Lord whom we love. So we do have powerful resources to resist that we didn't have before. The first of all is what I've been talking about, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But also, you have to continue to grow in grace because the short time that we're on earth, the world and the flesh and the devil throws everything they have at us. And by the way, we are easily targets because believers who have been truly born again, believers who are growing in grace and knowledge and are very serious students of the word of God and are doing their best to fulfill their mission, those are the ones that are going to get most attacked because most of the professing Christians aren't even saved. They have believed the lies of Satan and believed the false gospel. And there are many professing believers, even in Bible churches, that still don't get it. I, would, I don't know what the percentage is but I would say the great majority of people do not know how to regain fellowship with God post-salvation. And so they try to be as moral as they can. They go to the law, of course, that's what they do, which we know is a mistake. As we study God's word, we become stronger in our resolve to resist sin because our relationship with him grows along with our love and gratitude for our magnificent maker. So this again is we can have more resolve to resist sin because we know when we sin that our relationship with God is broken. We're still his children. We still have everything we had before. But we have to humble ourselves and acknowledge our sins and then we're right with him again. Because he makes war against the arrogant and he gives grace to the humble. And so as we grow in knowledge and we grow in the grace, we see his faithfulness, that gives us more resolve, hardens us more against the temptations that would get us not only consequences that always come with sin, but even worse, it breaks temporarily, breaks our fellowship with God. We don't want to jeopardize our fellowship. You could call it our fellowship, our association, our companionship, or our rapport. Our rapport. All those are the things that we jeopardize when we choose to sin. So we don't want to jeopardize those by gratifying our lusts. It is never, never worth it. The little bit of pleasure, temporary pleasure you may have out of satiating your lust has a, a huge backlash of guilt, fear, and a host of other things. That's in my review here we now go to Romans chapter 6 verse 16. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 you have it there on the board. This is a very popular phrase. Paul uses this all the time to start with. He says, do you not know I have to look that up. I bet he's, he's, he said at least 20 times in, the, in his epistles, somewhere along there probably. Do you not know? You ought to know. You need to remember this. It's important. Do you not know? Now, I want you to see as we go here, I put in parentheses the morphology of the verb know. It can be a noun, but it's not here. It's a verb. It's a perfect active indicative. So what that means is, if you know something, you've learned something, and you know it, that's a, something that happens in the past, 
But the result of that goes on and on indefinitely. That's the importance of knowing. Active voice, we produce the action, indicative mood, meaning this reality is not just a potential. So knowing is the first step forward for a Christian once he has been saved, the first thing he needs to do is start learning something so that he can know something. And it has permanent repercussions because of the perfect uh, perfect tense. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, now present yourselves, the word present is a verb, it's a present active indicative. You produce the action and it's reality, but it's a present tense. And I'm going to comment on that as we go in just a moment. So do not throw that, uh, do not, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves who you obey. And the word there are is another verb, and you'll notice it's a present active indicative as well. Ongoing action. And then it says, Did I, did I give you, yeah, you are is a present active indicative, and you, by the time you get to obey, that's, uh, you are that one slaves who you obey, and obey is a present active indicative as well. Whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Okay, we're going to start with those verbs that I just gave you. I'm going to show you something here. Notice that there are three present tenses our present tense verbs. Here we have present, here, are, and obey. So, three present tense verbs. This points to the fact that the verbs present, you are, and obey, those three verbs depict an action in progress, an ongoing action. It's linear action sort. That means it's like a, watching a movie. It just continues. It's moving. Uh, the perfect tense or the aorist tense is punctilio. That's like taking a snapshot. There it is. But present tense is moving. Now the context of this verse also suggests repetitive action or maybe an addictive action. Well, when you look at this, what it's talking about, it's talking about becoming slaves. And these verbs are in the present tense, ongoing action. So you put the fact that it's talking about being a slave to something, the, re the ongoing action could be repetitive, or it could be even worse than that. It could be an a, addiction, addicted to something. Addiction is... The devo uh, devotion of a person. How do you, am I saying that right? De devotion. I think I've given a devotional. <laughs> okay. Addiction is a devotion of a person to something, whether sin in general, or food, alcohol, or wealth in particular, so as to become dependent upon it. A person will never be satisfied in a state of slavery. A person who is addicted to something is never satisfied either. The answer to addiction is self-control through the resources of new life in Christ. Now, I got this from the Logos, Logos thematic outlines on addictions. And you can see how addiction would be appropriate here because you're talking about presenting yourself slaves to obey what? Your lust. Or you could be addicted to obeying God. That would be a good addiction. In Galatians chapter 22 verse 23 or 22 and 23 picks up this same word. Galatians 5:22 through 23 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There it is. I made it red for you. So we just found that the best way to end an addiction is to through self-control, through the resources of the new life in Christ, and that number one resource of the new life in Christ is the Holy Spirit. You were baptized with the Holy Spirit. You have access to his power and his leading and his control. But I want to look at self-control. What we're seeing up here, if you are in the first part here, it says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death, that would be an addiction. Or obedience leading to righteousness. But where you need the self-control is to do something about that slavery or addiction to sin which leads to death. Yes, sir? The sin leading to death, knowing This was a sin and a death. Mm -hmm. I would say early on in the game, it might be temporary death, which means you sin and you're out just for a short time. Or it could be operational death, which means you're in reversionism. And you haven't acknowledged your sin in a long time, and now you're not just a little bit temporary away and you acknowledge your sin, then you're back filled with the Holy Spirit, right with God, the... Uh, operation death means you're in serious trouble. And if that's not taken care of, then submitting to sin, being a slavery to sin, could very easily, or pro it's probable that you will uh, die the sin of the death. Okay? Good question. Okay. Now, the phrase, the fruit of the Spirit, you see it up here? In verse, the fruit of the Spirit, right here. Let's take a look at that a little closer right here. The phrase, the fruit of the Spirit, is the divine good that the Holy Spirit produces through us, which includes self-control. So when it says the fruit of of the Spirit. The fruit is the, the divine good that the Holy Spirit produces through us. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we are in a state of spirituality, meaning we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He is in command of the command post. He is teaching. He is guiding. He's doing all these things. The outcome of that is fruit, which I'm saying is the divine good that the Holy Spirit produces through us, which includes that whole list, but I want to look closely at self-control. Have you ever done something, and you know uh, it's, it wasn't right, but you did it anyway, and you seem to keep on doing that? All of us know what I'm talking about, because every one of us in our lives has an area of weakness. I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is, and you probably know what yours is. But you just have a hard time resisting the temptation to do whatever it is that your weakness is. So, when the Holy Spirit is in charge, he's going to give you the self-control so that you won't, you won't get into this uh, slavery condition of this sin that so easily besets us that would be the sin of weakness in your life. So every believer has a choice of what he will produce in this life. He cho his choices are sin, human good, or divine good. That's your choices. Sin, human good, our divine good. When he, the believer, is in carnality, and I have in parentheses by that, unconfessed sin exists, 
If you are a believer who have sinned and you have not confessed that sin, then the Bible says you are in carnality. You are estranged from God. And in that carnal position, you don't have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You cannot produce divine good. You cannot fr produce the fruit of the Spirit if you are in carnality, and the carnality means you are guilty of a sin that you have not confessed. So let's go over that again. Every believer has a choice of what he will produce in this life. His choices are sin, human good, or divine good. When he, we're talking about believers here, is in carnality, there's unconfessed sin in his life. He is under the control of his flesh. Also I have here are the old sin nature. Those are synonymous. He is under the control of his flesh or the old sin nature, which produces either sin or human good. That's the only thing that unbelievers can produce. They cannot produce divine good because they do not have the Holy Spirit. And believers can even produce divine good when they have unconfessed sins and the Holy Spirit is not available to them until they humble themselves before God, acknowledge their sins, and then boom, instantly they're good to go again. <clears throat> So, this is where I am here, if you're, <coughs> excuse me, following along, right here. No, I lost it. Let's see, I think I went too far. Yeah, I, I went too far. Okay, there we are. All right, so, so human good is man's effort to do good deeds based on motivation generated by his old sin nature. Now think about that for a moment. I, only spent, I spent a long time to word that just to where I think I got it right. I hope I do. I think I do. Again, what is human good? It is man's effort to do good deeds based on the motivation generated by his old sin nature. You can do good deeds and it is generated by your old sin nature, your flesh. Now, those good deeds is what I'm talking about here. They, the good deeds, may be appreciated and pleasing to others, but they are not appreciated nor acceptable to God. How could God appreciate or accept something that was generated by your old sin nature? I don't want to go too fast here. I want all this. I'm going to give you time to sink in. And if you don't get it or you have a question, let me, let me see your hand. Now, from a human perspective, these deeds are good. But they are worthless to God because anything that believers are carnal, excuse me, unbelievers or carnal believers do, do not impress him. They don't please him, nor are they acceptable to him. Indeed, they are rejected by him. But from a human perspective, they can't, you can't tell. And I'm talking about a legitimate, born-again believer when he is in carnality and he is producing human good, it is to be praised, it is to be applauded. Human good is not bad. It's just worthless with regards to our relationship with God. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Isn't it amazing how when you're looking the look at the Bible, <clears throat> it's binary. You have either this choice or that choice. And they're absolute. And that drives the postmoderns absolutely bonkers because you have your truth, I have my truth. There's, it's all kind of gray. And when you actually 
quote a scripture or you say something that is dogmatic, like this this verse here, the mindset on the flesh is death, the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. There is no, what's the third one? There is no third one. What about your status? At any given time, you're either spiritual because you are filled with the Holy Spirit or, or you are carnal. It's one or the other. And so we have another one right there. John chapter 6, verse 63 John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now let's stop there for just a moment. The flesh profits nothing. But you can produce human good through the flesh. You might be able to make a lot of friends, impress a lot of people. Maybe you can get a job because they heard how kind and caring and all these things are just phenomenal. But the only thing is they're worthless to God because the Holy Spirit is not producing it. The old sin nature, the flesh is producing it. So it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. That's where we were. No matter all the good you could do, it's nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life because they're spiritual. That's why unbelievers cannot understand the Bible because it is full of spiritual words and spiritual concepts and they are spiritually dead. They can't even know it. They can't, they can't understand the Bible. That's why when you're talking to unbelievers, don't get caught in the trap of them, what about this and what about that and what about this? You say, I don't care about any of that. I want to know what about Jesus Christ? What do you think of him? That's all I want to talk about. They can understand that. Do you know why they can understand that? I know some of you are grinning and say, you know what? <laughs> Scott's over here, ear to ear. Because Common grace means that when you give the gospel, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit rather, makes it clear and lucid and perspicuous to them. They can understand the gospel because of what God does when you give the gospel. But they can't understand all the other things. It really don't matter anyway. Now we've been talking about the human good. Now we're switching here in this paragraph right here. On the other hand, divine good is not only acceptable to God, it's rewardable. It's rewarded. Isn't that wonderful? He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to reward us because we're producing divine good, which the Holy Spirit is the one that is doing, doing it through us. But not only does it, he accept it, he rewards it. He commands it, he accepts it, and he rewards us. Divine good is pr produced by man when he is filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. To most believers, the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Some kind of thing out there you can't hardly... Uh, Put your word really what it what it or he is. Uh, but look how much the Holy Spirit has been mentioned by Paul only in the first 14 verses of chapter 6. If you don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit and what that means that to be in Christ, then you don't really know anything about the Holy Spirit. And few believers know that, by the way. So again, on the other hand, divine good is not only acceptable to God, it is rewardable. Divine good is produced by men, that means mankind, women too, of course, when he or she is filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Human good is dependent on, now we're back to human good here for a moment. Human good is dependent on man's puny power, and he gets a smidgen of glory for it. Just a little bit, somebody might say, oh, that's good. That's it. That's all he gets. What, what does that mean? Nothing. But divine good is dependent on God's omnipotent power and he gets eternal glory for it. 
can't hardly compare those two, can you? One you can't hardly see, and the other one you can't miss. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse five. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse five. Not that we are adequate in ourselves. In chapter 3 before this, it's talking about uh, all these things that need to be done. He says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Do you see how that fits in in what I'm telling you about the Holy Spirit? He is the one that makes us adequate for the task. And it is from God. You can have the most pure desire as a person in carnality. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe you have. I'm not, I should have worded that different. I don't know if you're in carnality, how pure your word or thoughts could be. But for an unbeliever, it doesn't matter how serious you are about doing good and you try your best, the problem is you're not adequate to do good that impresses God or that God will be pleased or that he will accept. Only the Holy Spirit can produce that fruit, that divine good that is accepted by God and rewarded by God. I'm hoping you've seen the big difference between these two. I found this on the, well, this was, G. Curtis Jones about illustrations for preaching and teaching. It says the following. The Holy Spirit has transforming power, uplifting power. That power makes us more than we are and fills us with energy. He makes a home for God in our hearts. He gives us purpose, direction, and stability. A person without the spirit is a, a phlegmatic, I guess that's the way you say it, pathetic soul. Now I looked up phlegmatic, how you say it? Phlegmatic, okay. Phlegmatic, and it means to just be laid back, uh, calm, kind of... Uh, Stoic, not get, it means you're not excited, all energized or something. A person without the spirit is really dull <laughs> about that. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, Second Corinthians three five. Yeah, it's no. It's saying not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything coming from ourselves as pleasing to God. That's what that's talking about. Are acceptable to God. Well. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because this is key. You can know if the good you're doing or whatever you're doing is acceptable or God or not. You can always tell whether it is human good or divine good. How do you do that? Can somebody answer that question? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit or not? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're going to be producing divine good. If you're not, it's going to be human good. So if you're ever doing something and you think, okay, I, I understand the difference between human good and divine good, but I'm really not sure in this case. What do you want to do? You want to shut it down right there and do a little inspection of your soul to see if there's any unconfessed sins. And when you start thinking about the good deed you did and your human good, but you start thinking about it, and you think, my, oh yeah, you know, my motive was I was really trying to shine in my neighbor's eyes there. I, I don't think that would measure out, see? You see what I'm saying? 
You see how you can tell? It's really simple when you understand the difference between the two. And all you have to do is do a inspection of your soul, which we should do often. And, and when you start thinking about it, if you, if you think, well, I was really trying to please the Lord in this. I know I have a hard time, but it purposely was meeting the Holy Spirit in this. And so then you can tell it's divine good. Is it, it, y'all all get that? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, there's another thing. When, when you do something that is divine good and it's done through the Holy Spirit, you're not going to have any guilt. You're not. It, it, you're, you're you're going to have uh, security. You're going to have the sense that uh, of joy that you were used by God in order to do whatever His will was. For a while, she says, well, you can fool yourself. Let me ask you. <laughs> well, people fool themselves all the time. I mean, if you want something really bad, you can rationalize and spin it to where, well, I should have this. And so what does God do? Does he just strike you with leprosy because you, he didn't want No, he'll let you do it. Go ahead and do it. Knock your lights out. Have it. And that is going to be the worst decision you made because it's going to haunt you. Yeah. It's, see, a lot of times man has, well, not us sometimes, but all the time man is wanting to glorify himself rather than God. And if he can see something that he can do and it's going to get, everybody's going to see it and he's going to be uh, looking good in the eyes of other people, that is a approbation lust. It's a very strong lust. And so you say, I'm going to do it. And you do it and everybody, oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, that's great and all that. Oh, fine. But all that is baloney. Because your motivation wasn't humble, obedient, and counting on the Holy Spirit to produce it. And everybody might think about how great you are, but in your own mind, you need to go to God and say, I had approbation lust and I pulled the trigger and I was feeling good about it and you were left out. That's the only way. You better do that. Because if you don't, how, if you keep going down that road, it's a disaster. I get that right. Arrogance versus true humility. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people that walk slump shoulder and you talk to them, you know, oh, well, I'm a... Uh, you know, that's baloney. That's fake, see? But the only thing, here's the thing. We can't get away from God. And He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you do. It, it, now, if we could hide it from God, if we could say, okay, I'm going to turn my thinking off. I'm going to go over here and get a little glory for myself here. And He won't notice. That's not going to happen. So, we need to think these things through before we do it. It doesn't mean we 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 should not do it, but it means we need to do it with a different motivation. Because God knows not only what you think, but the motivations of your heart. If that motivation has left out the Lord and the Holy Spirit is not there, what is it produced by? Your flesh, your old sin nature. That's why God hates it. Isaiah, uh, what is it, 46, 6, something like that, I believe that he sees them as filthy rags. They're repugnant to him. Because people are so big on their own things that they do. And they are good things. They're not bad things. But it makes them swell on the inside and God was left out of it. And what they're doing is becoming an idol to themselves and God hates it. That's why we have to make these distinctions to see what they are because it's important to know. I have one more little short one here that we, we can get in. This one was the invincible power. This one is the life-giving spirit. The pearl divers 
lives, excuse me, lives at the bottom of the ocean by means of pure air conveyed to them from above. His life is entirely dependent on the breath from above, from above him. We are down here like the di diver to gather pearls for our master's crown. The source of our life comes from the life-giving spirit. What this is saying, this is by Henry Drummond, what this is saying is we need the Holy Spirit as much as we need oxygen. And that is true. Now you can ignore him and you can go on your own way and take all the glory for the human good you do, but you're going to pay for it. Human good has not been judged. It has been postponed. It will be judged. Unbelievers are going to have their human good judged by Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment and they will be indicted for that human good because they rejected God's perfect good and accepted their own good. They thought, I can make it into heaven by what I do, not what Christ did. For the believer, human good still has not been judged yet either. In fact, I don't like to use the word judge. It is going to be evaluated at the great white throne judgment. It's not, it's not about sin. It's about uh, how much of the time did you spend filled with the Holy Spirit producing divine good? Did you spend any time? And all of us have produced human good, even as believers we do it. And there's going to be a big bonfire. It's going to make the Aggie bonfire, which they don't have anymore, but it would make it look like a little... Uh, cook out in the backyard for some. Of course, there are some people that they don't produce hardly anything. <laughs> they're, just, they're just blobs. Okay, I think I'm going to throw the, what, the uh, anchor out here. Now, do I need to go over anything else? Because these things are basic. But when it comes to basic things, you have to get them right. You have to get them absolutely right. And I, I haven't looked at any, all these paragraphs that I did here about self-control and all of these things here. I just thought, it, one reason it takes me so long to study is because I'm not going over here and grabbing somebody else. That sounds good and putting it over here. Now, sometimes I take a quote that really impresses me and I do that. But I just put what I know through Scripture and the original language and all that together and I don't know, it, it might sound uh, arrogant, but I like what I have said here about the human good as opposed to divine good. I like it better than the other things that I've read. And I'm not trying to say, oh, this is great. What I'm saying is I take the time and I'll change this word, I'll come back and I'll change that eight or ten times before it's finally, okay, that's what I want it. And I hope that you will go over the notes again and, and very carefully look like when, when a believer is in carnality because of unconfessed sins, he is under the control of the flesh or his old sin nature, the same which produces either sin or human good. That's what the old sin nature generates. And people think, oh no, this is good. It's good that is worthless. Is what I want to say. Okay. If there's no questions, we're going to close. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can go to your word and extrapolate these things that we can apply to our own life. And they can become part of who we are because it's how we think. And we can understand what human good is and why it's not acceptable to God and it doesn't please him. It's coming from the flesh, the old sin nature. So help us to distinguish these things and be able to articulate these things to others. It's incumbent upon us not to just learn these things and know them, but to be able to relay that to other people. They desperately need to hear it. So we pray that you will give us the courage and the opportunity and everything we need in order to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We'll have you fun nights tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hear that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>